Okay, let's get started. Uh, so we're going to do GI radiology today. The content is based on the USMLE content list as before. Um, huge thanks to Amy who helped me with this lecture. Uh, there's a lot to cover today. Uh, so this is very interactive as, as our prior lectures. Uh, so this patient presents with dysphagia. What is the study? Upper GI, good. Uh, well, it's an esophagram, good, but it's um, similar. And we'll talk about the differences. If this patient presents with left lower quadrant pain. What is going on? Left lower quadrant pain, what is going on? So Jordan thinks diverticulitis, okay. Good, anyone else? Where are my diverticulosis? Good, ulcerative colitis, good. Okay, let's keep going. Where is the abnormality? Patient, young patient with abdominal pain. Which segment of the small bowel is abnormal? The jejunum, the ileum, the duodenum, or all of it? Not sure. Okay, that, that's reasonable. What study is this? Um, so this is a CT scan, and you see I give you three different phases. We call the phases. Um, the first phase is dark. The second phase is enhancing, but only certain things are enhancing. Whereas the third phase, some parts of it are... It's hypo-enhancing on the venous phase. Correct. So it is with and without IV contrast. Good. So this one is without because it's dark. And this one is with. And you know that because the aorta is bright. But the brightness of the aorta changes. Uh, what is this procedure called? So the patient has the same diagnosis as the previous one. Good. Angiography, good. And can you be specific about what kind of angiography? Angiography is diagnostic, meaning we're just trying to figure out what's going on. Therapeutic means you're actually trying to treat the underlying tumor, which we see in this case. What is the diagnosis here? Patient comes in with abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting. Uh, this is a CT scan. And you see that some of the bowel is really, really dilated. And some of the bowel is completely decompressed. IBD, yeah, possibly. Ulcerative colitis, that's a good guess. Toxic megacolon, okay? So all the um, guesses so far have been uh, regarding colon. Um, so colon, uh, it's a picture frame. So it's ascending is right here, transverse is right here, and then the descending is right here where the gas bubble is. So this is more central. So in the center of the abdomen lives the small bowel. Um, so this is more of a small bowel process. So we'll talk about that. What is this study? And why do we use this study? It was approved by the U.S. Preventive Task Force in 2016 for screening, screening for what though? And I don't know. Okay, we'll go over that. What is this study? So this study has the best soft tissue resolution and I'm showing you a specific sequence on a study to discuss a topic. Um, good, it's an MRI, good. There's several uh, diseases on the USMLE content list that uses these two sequences to diagnose the patient's condition. Uh, so normal structures, you know, this is, this is sort of your basic first year um, material. You know, it's just from your mouth to your anus. That's the GI tract. So here is a CT abdomen and pelvis. And is this normal? What do you think? Colon looks abnormal. Good. Okay, can you, so when we describe abnormality, we think about thickness and dilatation caliber. Is it thick-walled or is it distended? You can also evaluate thick-walled. Good. So this is the transverse colon. So there's three mesocolons. There's a transverse mesocolon, which is what this is. There's a small bowel mesocolon, and then the third mesocolon is a sigmoid, but we can't see in this image. But the, the mesocolon, what do you think about these little linear uh, ves like vessels. What, what is that? So the, this is um, an engorged like vasa rector. Uh, that's those are the little vessels that feed the mesentery, and so it's thick walled. And you can see here, there's um, this is free fluid. Um, so there's inflammatory changes, and there's free fluid. Good. So this is pan colitis. Pan colitis means the entire colon is inflamed. Depending on the patient's clinical context, it could be from different causes. So if the patient comes in with prior antibiotic, broad spectrum antibiotic for treatment, and they wipe off 
they, they wiped out their colonic flora, then they're going to get um, this condition called pseudomembranous colitis caused by C. diff. Uh, this is treated with vancomycin or flagell or in, and in very severe refractory cases, um, fecal transplant. So a stool from a normal patient is then put into the stool of the uh, sick patient to reconstitute the normal flora. What segment of the bowel looks abnormal? So this one, the a small bowel is abnormal. Um, so here, this is normal bowel. Jejunum is here. Jejunum is the proximal bowel. The ileum lives here. That's the second half of the bowel. They're in different locations. Um, the duodenum rotates. I don't know if you can see it here, but the duodenum sort of is a C loop. Um, it goes from the right across the spine under the SMA and it goes to the left. And this is where the jejunum is. And this is ligament of tritis right here and the duodenal jejunal junction. Um, so here the normal bowel wall is should be less than three millimeters. And if you look at here, it's thick. Um, the normal caliber should be three centimeters, so it's the rule of threes. And so the caliber looks fine, but the wall looks thick. And if you look here, there's also an abnormal segment here, abnormal segment here, here. So it's a pretty diffuse, like ileal wall thickening. Um, so this is what we see with inflamed bowel, uh, and that condition is called enteritis. And enteritis can be from different causes. It's uh, infection, uh, ischemia, so the patient, um, but then also radiation. People who've had prior radiation therapy will get radiation enteritis and uh, shock bowel, uh, so just from hypoperfusion. Okay, so this one um, is, what kind of image is this? Good, okay, ultrasound, and this one is CT in the right upper quadrant. These two images are what? MRI is, you can think of it like your phone. On top of you have apps, so you can have a lot of different apps. So MRI, you have the magnet, but within the magnet, you can put different recipes of sequences, which are like apps, and each sequence tells you slightly different information and serves a different function. One of the app is called, or one of the sequences is called diffusion-weighted imaging, DWI. And what that looks at is water motion. So if you, um, what, if you have like a, a sponge, right? And you put the sponge in the water, the sponge will fill up with water, obviously, right? Let's say within that sponge, you put a gummy bear in the sponge. It's going to soak up the water less. And is restricting the water less. And that's what an abscess is. An abscess is a really thick collection, like a gummy bear. It's incredibly thick, right? So you, water can't move around as much. So it restricts water motion. And that's what we're seeing here, is the water motion in this abscess is being restricted. So it's really bright. It's the gummy bear within um, the liver. So that's what the DWI is. It's helpful to show you restricted water motion. So it can be helpful in the setting of abscesses, tumors. It has a thick wall here, if you can see. And the wall, the phase is a little off, but it's enhancing. Um, and there's a lot of, it's not a simple fluid like water. It's complex, thick, viscous abscess, okay? So typically abscesses, we say the rule of thumb is three centimeters. If it's three greater than three centimeters and needs to be drained percutaneously. Uh, so the interventional radiologist just puts a, um, a wire and a pigtail catheter in here. If it's less than three centimeters, then you can try a trial of antibiotics uh, and then and then see you notice know, the will work. Good. So what study is this? This was just FDA approved last year. Go ahead. Yeah, this is contrast enhanced ultrasound. Does the same thing as other contrast enhanced studies do, but it um, it's CO2. It can be done with patients with renal failure because you just breathe it out, right? CO2 is part of our buffer system. Septation is in thickening, and then there's a, an area that's not enhancing corresponding to the... There's um, large volume. Um, but what do you notice about the peritoneum? So we have the visceral and the parietal peritoneum. It's thickened, yeah. It's thickened, and you can see it. It's enhancing, um, and it's inflamed, exactly. So there's something that's causing the peritoneum to become um, inflamed. And so this is, so this one is peritonitis. So here is um, a patient who comes in. The abnormality is um, this. 
an enlarged lymph node. Lymph nodes should typically be really tiny and they're kind of bean shaped. Once they start to get enlarged or look like a ball instead of a bean, then you start to worry about some kind of disease process. Uh, so Whipple's disease is caused by an infection, actinobacteria. Patients typically present with lymphadenopathy and the lymphadenopathy is pretty remarkable and it's low density. So it's not density um, we think about relative to water, low, low density compared to say soft tissue, which, which is isodense. So um, this is Whipple's disease. It's, this is one of our quiz questions. So this is a CT enterography. So an enterography, it is a CT of intestines and we do a special study The, this, the water, the fluid is low density. So we call this negative contrast because it's dark. In contrast to positive contrast, which is bright. Negative contrast allows us to see the lining, the wall of the bowel better than positive contrast. So here what we see is, um, this is normal bowel up here. Wall is thick reaction. So this is, they call this the comb sign because there's engorged vasa recta. Uh, and what do you think about the enhancement of the bowel wall? Hyperemic, good. So there's um, bowel wall thickening, hyperemic bowel, so it's acutely inflamed, and there's um, engorged vasorect. And we only see one segment. But this is um, Crohn's. Or this is one presentation of Crohn's. Crohn's, um, there's several. There's active inflammatory, which is what this is, because it's acutely inflamed. You told me that there's a hyperemic and this thick wall. So here is an MRI enterography. So this is a CT. You could do the same thing with MRI. MRI is better. Keep your eye focused on this point. You'll see that several of the bowel loops are getting tethered. And this is a, a we call this penetrating disease, where there's inflammation and it causes the bowel to become and you know to one point. And eventually it can develop strictures right there, a segment of bowel that's really narrow. Um, so that's stricture when after a while the inflammation can settle down and then it can scar down and become stenotic stricture and then cause bowel obstruction um, and you treat it with biologic agents steroids um, and in some cases you have to do surgery ulcerative colitis is the other form of inflammatory bowel disease and mesentery it's like engorged um, and it's a continuous segment, right? So here, that's the descending. There's the rectum, and you see the, um, or the sigmoid, um, and then the rec it extends into the rectum. So it's a continuous long segment uh, thickening uh, with sort of somewhat, a little bit of hyperemia. Uh, so this is called lead pipe colon. Um, we see this with ulcerative colitis. Um, they lose normal haustral folds. So here's the normal haustral folds. And you lose that. You lose all that. So you lose the normal morphology. Um, the wall becomes sort of straight and narrow. Uh, and that's what uh, ulcerative colitis is. And in severe cases, um, the only way to really correct it long-term is to do a total proctal collective. Uh, so here, what do you see on this radiograph? This is normal-looking radiograph. The colon is huge. And there's there are a lot of causes of toxic megacolon, including pseudomembranous colitis, Crohn's, etc. It's critical to treat the underlying cause uh, to prevent perforation. Moving on to the next section, and the next topic is neoplasm. This is a CT um, pelvis, and we see this mass in the rectum. Um, so this one was found incidentally, but this was the corresponding um, MRI rectal rectum protocol. Um, that was done uh, to look at the mass because they wanted to know the spread, the T staging, uh, we call it. So MRI helps determine if it's a T2 versus T3 disease because T2 is treated with surgery, whereas T3 is treated with chemo radiation. The, the American Cancer Society currently recommends screening colonoscopy or CT colonography uh, in four, Patients who are 45 years or older, uh, this, these are the new guidelines as of last year. Age was changed from 50 to 45. 
there are several risk factors. Uh, patients who have adenomatous or serrated polyps, uh, familial cancer syndromes like um, FAP, um, Lynch syndrome. Also, IBD increases your risk, so patients with the ulcerative colitis are at increased risk for colorectal cancer. Uh, smoking, uh, eating, um, processed meat, and low-fiber diet. Uh, so this is um, a, what a CT colonoscopy look like. Uh, so you know about colonoscopy probably. You could do the same thing virtually um, with CT scanner. So you insufflate the colon with CO2, um, about six, seven liters, right? That distends the colon, and then you get a CT scan. And then the computer generates a virtual colon colonography uh, like this. So you then can look for polyps and masses and lesions as part of screening. But in, in addition, you also get the rest of the abdomen too because you, you, know, you get everything else as well. So this is um, approved by the U.S. Preventive Task Force as screening for colon cancer in addition to colon colonoscopy. So this is a double contrast, you see, because the patient has bubbly air, like it's like Alka-Seltzer, Alka-Seltzer, and then there's contrast as well. So it's a double contrast, so you see air and um, contrast. So this is normal. This is a normal sophogram. Um, this is, what do you think about this? Is this normal looking? What's abnormal about it? What do you think? Let the patient go, nothing to do, don't worry about it. Slow movement of fluid, good, yeah, it's slow. And what else do you notice about the wall? There's these webs, right? There's like filling defects. We call them filling defects, it's irregular. This is a CT scan of the same patient. And so you can see this is the esophagus or this is the area that we're imaging and there's esophageal cancer. Um, and this is the mass and it looks webby because you have all the small, um, sort of just ulcerating and invading. So that's why it looks webby and, and whatnot. So. Worldwide, squamous cell is the most common, but in the United States, adeno is actually the most common. And it um, involves the lower third. Uh, squamous cell involves the upper two-third. Um, and adeno is what's seen with Barrett's esophagus, uh, metaplasia, and then they are at an increased risk for developing adenocarcinoma. Uh, so here, this is another esophagram, and what do you notice about distended esophagus? So this is a web. Um, very good question. So there's a waste here, um, like someone's pinching that collar there. So that's a web and it can cause uh, dysphagia. So this one is um, from Barrett's esophagus. So Barrett's esophagus is when you have transformation of normal esophageal epithelium into abnormal epithelium. And, and typically, so here's a G junction. This is the distal esophagus. And so you see this structure. It's sort of in the mid-distal esophagus, right? It's not in the distal esophagus. It's in the mid-distal. And the reason is because this particular area, that's the metaplastic portion. So the normal portion is here. The transition is here. So when the patient has reflux, um, the transition point is where it gets structured down and narrow because of the acid irritation. Um, and that's why the stricture is in the mid-distal. In contrast to normal re reflux structures, which are typically down here. Reflux structures, the normal transition is down here, so then that's where the structure happens. But in Barrett's, it's, it's up higher in the mid to distal, where the transition from metaplasia to normal epithelium is. Okay, so we're gonna move still in malignancy. Okay, so this is a CT abdomen and pelvis, and I'm um, showing you this because I want you to look at the stomach. The stomach here, this is a normal stomach, but here, if you look at the stomach here, there's, it's incredibly thick, right? And there's little polypoid lesions as well. Like diffuse sort of thickening of the cardia um, and the fundus. Around the pancreas, there are lesions. This is a patient who has an MEN syndrome. So patients with MEN syndromes get like pancreatic lesions, they get um, parathyroid lesions, pituitary lesions. So this patient has these little, this is called a dotatate study. Um, it looks at somatostatin expression, uh, which we see with neuroendocrine tumors, uh, and MEN is one of them. So here um, we have uh, uptake of dotatate in um, the peripancreatic masses, um, and there's sort of scattered uptake within the stomach. Uh, so this is an MEN syndrome. Uh, consistent with neuroendocrine. And so this is, we call it the Zellinger-Ellison syndrome. So the gastric wall becomes thickened because the gastronoma releases gastrin 
which hyper causes hyperstimulation. So you see that. Um, so this is ZE uh, syndrome, uh, and it's secondary to gastrinoma, uh, which we can see better on the dotatate study because right there, it's taken it, it's taking it up because it expresses much stem. Okay. Um, so in ZE syndrome, we get thickened rugal folds, which we see here, multiple gastric. There are different types of neuroendocrine tumors. The traditional classification had been based on the naming, carcinoid, vipomas, gastronomas. The new WHO classification is based on grades, grade one, two, three, based on KI67 expression. Cancers, still in cancer. Um, here we have an upper GI. So upper GI is an esophagram plus the stomach. So let me just orient you. This is the lesser curvature. Uh, this is the greater curvature of the stomach. This is the contrast in the um, fundus. And then this is the contrast in the rest of the, um, like the body and the antrum of the stomach is here. So we have these little round filling defects, right? So it's pooching in. And so then the contrast goes around it you know, a nodule within the stomach. And the nodule could be anything. It could be hypoplastic nodules. It could be adenomatous nodules. Um, it could, I mean, in this case, this was a, you know, carcinoid, uh, but you can't get the histotype based on the imaging appearance, um, although we can give a differential diagnosis. Um, but this patient also has this finding, which is a lymph node metastases. Um, and this is a special kind of lymph node metastases because it has these radiating structures here that's pulling the bowel in or desmoid reaction um, and this is classically what happens in patients with carcinoid carcinoid is a small bowel tumor and the bowel the, the carcinoid will metastasize the lymph node and then cause this reaction that pulls the different um, bowel segments into it uh, causing a desmoblastic reaction so this is um, small bowel carcinoid uh, it's a type of neuroendocrine tumor um, they release serotonin, and that can go into the portal hepatic system and cause the serotonin syndrome, or carcinoid syndrome, which is like they get diarrhea and flushing. Um, so we can see that this is a nice study. It's, you know, well-distended stomach, and we see this little thing hanging off the um, wall, stomach wall. Um, so this, it's a soft tissue mass, and it's off the wall. Uh, and so this is typically how gastrointestinal tumors look like, the gist. Um, so G gist is a tumor that arises from the submucosa, and it typically has this mutation C-kit, uh, which is important because you can target that mutation um, with Gleevec, which blocks this tyrosine kinase. Um, and you know, so it shrinks it down, and then it can then be um, resected depending on how big it is. Um, so this is uh, just typical presentation. Um, in contrast to GIST, um, here is an MRI. Uh, so we it's contrast enhanced. So the S, the mesenteric vessels, the SMA, SMV, are bright. So it's a liver, and you can see the MRI. We can look at the bowel really beautifully, right? And this is um, this is the normal jejunum, and this is the normal ileum. Um, you see they have different appearance as well because the jejunum is a, there's a lot more folds in the jejunum than there's in the ileum, um, and then. The wall looks very thin, which is normal, and it's not distended, which is normal. Um, but if you look at this segment of the jejunum, there is this bright structure here that's inside the wall, in the bowel, um, and it's enhancing. Um, so this is a small bowel tumor. And small bowel tumors, there's um, benign and malignant. There's lipomas, which are fat lesions. And then there's um, malignant ones like carcinoid, and then you also have metastatic small bowel lesions, which are um, actually more common than primary bowel tumors. Um, so here, in contrast, here's a CT abdomen and pelvis, coronal. Um, and if you look at the stomach, so the normal stomach, uh, we see the rugal folds. Here, we lose the normal rugal folds, and it's very thick. So this is an infiltrative process. Um, so when we see this, so we think about um, this is called linitis plastica. Uh, it's gastric cancer, infiltrative gastric cancer uh, that causes the, there's no distension of the stomach because it's like tumor down. It's just, uh, and so, and then um, in some cases, some like it, it's gastric adenocarcinoma. It can cause obstruction as well. Um, but you need biopsy because you can, um, lymphoma can look very similar. Uh, the difference between lymphoma 
in gastric cancer is lymphoma is a very soft tumor, so it doesn't cause obstruction, whereas gastric cancer is very hard, uh, and so it causes gastric outlet obstruction. Um, so this is what linitis plastica looks like from gastric adenocarcinoma. So here we have a thick-walled colon, and so we think in the caliber, right? So you, the wall should be less than three millimeters. This is the normal appearance of the wall. And here it's not, um, it's markedly thickened. Uh, and it's, um, if you look at the fat around it, you see that there's a little bit of um, abnormal increased signal uh, density here. So this is infiltrative colon cancer. So it's sort of starting to invade, invade the adventitia of the colon. Um, so this is a Siegel mass, uh, colon, Siegel cancer. So that's colon cancer. Um, here's another segment of the colon, the rectum. Um, so here's a mass, it's an MRI. And uh, so MRI is really important for rectal cancer staging. Uh, so we see that this is the rectum, uh, the wall of the rectum. This is a mesorectal fascia, this dark band. It's the uh, fascia that surrounds the rectum. The normal uh, wall is dark, and here it's gray. So we call this evil gray um, because now you're worried that the the mass has extended beyond the wall and now into the mesorectal fat. Um, that's the mass. And then here's the sagittal image of the mass. Um, so malignant, we're going to move on um, to hereditary syndromes. So one of this is the hereditary non-polyposis, the Lynch syndrome, uh, which is due to a mutation in the mismatch, DNA mismatch repair. So patients get a lot of different kinds of cancer. Here's a patient who had primary rectal cancer. You see this is a normal bowel wall of the rectum. And then here you have bowel wall thickening and mass like soft tissue attenuate um, signal. And there's um, adenopathy here, um, lymph node metastasis. Uh, and then after shortly like a year, or two years after the mass rectal cancer was resected, the patient developed another tumor. Here you see the soft tissue mass in the retroperitoneum. Um, it's, you know, encasing the vessels. Uh, so this is a desmoid tumor. Here you can see that this patient had the surgery and then had an ileostomy. So the small bowel was brought up as part of the surgery for the rectal cancer. Uh, and then you, we have here a desmoid. So this patient has um, Lynch syndrome. Um, and in women, they can also get ovarian cancers. They can get uterine cancers uh, as well. Um, here, what we see is these little soft tissue nodules here that is um, you know, filling defects. So these are poly polyps. There's like tons of polyps, little polyps here, polyps here. There's polyps everywhere. Um, and this is um, FAP, um, familial adenomatous polyposin syndrome, due to uh, APCG mutation. And uh, patients have a high risk of colon cancer, so sometimes they will get prophylactic colon cancer. The polyps here are in the small bowel, not in the colon, um, but they're all, they also have a high, wait, you know, I'm sorry, I think I made a mistake. This is colon, um, so we only see one slice of it, but yeah, um, there's a very high risk of colon cancer transformation, so many patients will just get a prophylactic total colectomy. Here is a, a CT, just CT abdomen and pelvis. It's calcified, yeah. So you see these calcifications along the wall? So this is called the porcelain gallbladder. Uh, and patients with porcelain gallbladder are at increased risk for gallbladder cancer. Good, yeah. And if you look, you can also see that the background liver is not normal either. The liver is um, nodular. Um, the liver is nodular, is shrunken. So the patient has background cirrhosis as well, uh, which increases the risk of uh, HCC in this patient. So the gallbladder was resected and there was gallbladder cancer within it. Um, in contrast, um, this is a patient who uh, came in with high, high bilirubin uh, and jaundice. So they got a CT, abdomen and pelvis. And you see um, that this is a bile ducts. Um, and right there, this is a CBD. And you have the intrahepatic ducts. It's very dilated. Normally, you shouldn't see the ducts. And now we see it very well. And if you look down here, um, it tapers down into this area where there's a mass here. Yeah, that's cholangiocarcinoma. And you see the portal vein um, 
is right here. This, this is the portal vein. There's um, is is very close to the portal vein. Um, this patient, um, this so this is Klatskin tumor. There's different types of cholangiocarcinomas. It, um, the cholangio ca cancers that involve the hilum is called Klatskin, but they can also be intrahepatic, peripheral, intraductal. But Klatskin, this is a Klatskin um, tumor. All right, so um, keeping in the same region, um, this is um, a mass that's in the liver um, rather than in the CBD that we saw the slide before. So this says non-contrast, everything's dark, the aorta is dark. This is contrast enhanced, there's arterial enhancement and venous enhancement. And you see that on the arterial, there's this enhancing, it's enhancing, right? This part is abnormal and it looks different from the rest of the liver. The liver looks no abnormal too. It's very nodular. It's um, small. So the patient has cirrhosis. So there's this enhancing region. And on the delayed, so contrast, you know, goes into the arteries, and then goes through the capillaries, and then through the veins, and then goes back to the heart. Um, so this here, we're in the arterial phase, and this is in the venous phase. And we know that's in the venous phase because the hepatic veins, you can see the hepatic veins now, right? sort of returning to the heart. So um, on the venous phase, the contrast washes out. It washes in, washes out. And so this is, uh, we call um, HCC, hepatocellular carcinoma. And this is diagnostic, uh, wash in and wash out appearance in patients with cirrhosis. Um, and we use this uh, category called LIRADS. Um, so tumors have increased neovascularity. They just have a lot more blood vessels going in, so that's why it's enhancing. And there's a lot more blood vessels that drain the, um, the, the sort of angiogenesis, right? So it, it drains the blood supply, so it washes out. The blood drains faster than the normal background parenchyma. So this is diagnostic for HCC because the patient has background cirrhosis. And the way you, to treat HCC is to... Depending on the size, they can, the definitive treatment is liver transplant, but organ allocation is limited because we don't have sufficient organs to meet everyone who needs it. So there's um, TACE, trans arterial chemoembolization. So HCC, we said, is neo, is very vascular. So there's a lot of neoadjuvants. So you can see this parasitic vessel here that is supplying this mass. So you can block that artery uh, with little beads, and that's what we see here. You block that, block the supply and kill the tumor. Uh, so this is called transarterial chemoembolization taste. Um, patients, and that's reserved for like larger tumors. Um, patients who have smaller tumors, like we see here, there's this little focus here. It's smaller, as you can see, compared to the other tumor that we saw. Um, they can get an ablation. Um, so an ablation, you see this needle here. It's going in, and it, it and at the tip it burns. So you basically burn the tumor. And it's done percutaneously through the skin, um, and patients come in for the treatment, and then they leave the same day. And then this is the post ablation treatment. So you can see this is the area that got burned by the tips of the ablation probes. So now it's no longer enhancing like it was um, before the ablation. Okay, so this is called ablation. And so those are the different ways to keep the tumor under control until the patients can get liver transplant. Um, all right, keep moving on. So malignant neoplasm, so this is peritoneal. So this is a CT abdomen and pelvis. Um, there's oral contrast. If you look at the bowel, there's contrast. And then there's a large volume free fluid. So, but it's not simple fluid. Look at this. So you have these little nodules here on the side. Um, and the, if you look at the mesentery, it's sort of messy, kind of dirty looking, and there's nodules everywhere. Um, uh, so this is called peritoneal carcinomatosis, along the, right there, along the diaphragm, you can see the carcinomatosis. Um, this is called carcinomatosis when you have cancer that's spread into the peritoneum and mesentery. So uh, it's um, common places are mucinous tumors, so um, gastric cancer, um, ovarian, uh, epithelial neoplasms, carcin you know, mucinous adenocarcinomas, serous adenocarcinomas, uh, uh, pancreatic uh, cancers. Uh, so it, it's, it just, it all means it's, it's distance spread. When you have gastric cancer with peritoneal deposits into the ovaries, that's called a Krukenberg tumor. 
when you have gastric cancer implants that go down into the um, ovaries. So it's just peritoneal spread of cancer. Um, this is an MRI. Um, and here we have uh, the liver, and this is a stomach. Uh, and then this is the CBD right here. And then this is the gallbladder. Uh, the pancreas is um, in this region down here. So here, the, if you look at the CBD, it's very um, dilated, intra and extra hepatic. And then if you look, it sharp. there's a sharp tapering, not narrowing right here. Um, a sudden narrowing. And then if you look carefully, there's this mass here. It's a pancreatic head mass. Um, so that's what pancreatic cancer looks like. Here is the MIP version of this patient. So there's a sharp cutoff here, and uh, the patient has severe biliary dilatation um, from the pancreatic head mass. So um, they have this thing called a double duck sign. That's when you see both the CBD as well as the portal vein. Um, but that's on ultrasound. I mean, we don't, we don't really. Um, and then <clears throat> sometimes um, it can obstruct the pancreatic duct as well. So actually, that uh, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Um, double duct sign is when you have the pancreatic ductal dilatation with the CBD dilatation. Uh, we don't have the pancreatic ductal dilatation here, but we have the CBD dilatation because it's invading the proximal, uh, the distal CBD. So that is pancreatic cancer. Um, so alkalasia, okay, so okay. now we're moving on to the esophagus, oh, 920. Okay, so here is an esophagram. <clears throat> and what you see is there's abnormal, um, so there's primary and secondary contractions, but it's abnormal because it's the GE junction. It doesn't open, right? So normal um, fluid, when they drink it, should go through the GE junction, and it's not. It's, it stops at the GE junction. And if you... This is a cinnate, but there's this beak-like appearance because it, it's just not able to go, and there's this trickle of contrast that goes down. Here's another patient with the same condition. They drink the barium, and it, there's a little trickle here at the G junction, and it just stops here. So this is called achalasia. Achalasia is when the myenteric plexus are not working well, so the lower esophageal sphincter does not relax. So the only way for the fluid to pass is when the pressure in the esophagus exceeds the pressure of the G junction, the lower esophageal sphincter. Um, there's primary and secondary achalasia. Primary is from, um, we don't know what it's from, but secondary is from Chagas. There's a lot of different causes. Um, but the way you treat it is to a myotomy, so you cut the muscle to relax it, uh, and that can be done endoscopically or surgically. Okay, this is, um, in contrast to what we just saw, here we have primary, yeah, tertiary contractions, right? Look at this, it's, there's, um, it's abnormal, there's, uh, and this is called dis dysmotility. Uh, dysmotility just means, it's, there's no obstruction like we saw with the achalasia, um, but the actual contractions are abnormal and non-propulsive. So that can cause patient's dysphagia. Um, in contrast, here is a, a web. So the patient drinks, and you see this little waist here is pinched. Um, so that's a cervical web, um, and that can obstruct. So if the patient, you know, took a big solid bolus of food, it can get stuck here. So the this is called a, a Zenker's diverticulum. Um, the outpouching is seen posteriorly, and so this the esophagus is here, and then this is the outpouching, and Patients can have food that gets stuck there, and they can have severe halitosis, and it can be resected. Um, more problems with esophagus. Here, this is a CT scan. This is the pulmonary artery. This is posteriorly and posterior radius sinum is the esophagus. And so this is the esophagus, and here we see air outside the esophagus. The esophagus is thickened, and there's air. So there's esophageal perforation. Um, one of the syndrome that's been described is called the Mallory Weiss syndrome, uh, and it can cause an subcutaneous tissue because it's continuous um, if it's severe enough. Perfect. Um, so here um, we have a CT abdomen and pelvis, and um, this is the stomach that's gone up into the chest cavity, uh, and that's called a hydrohernia uh, that 
uh, can, you know, there's different degrees of it. Like the whole stomach can be inside the chest wall. Um, so this is a esophagram. This is a heart in the background. This here is the diaphragm. So you see that the um, stomach is part of the stomach or majority of the stomach is in the chest. So this is called a hydrohernia. And sometimes it can cause dysphagia and patients have to get that surgically corrected. Um, here's another example of a nice stricture, a web um, so esophagram. And so you see the distal esophagus, there's this waste um, that can cause dysphagia. Uh, so this commonly is from reflux stricture um, in the distal esophagus. And we said before, if it was like Barrett, it could be here or even more proximal. Uh, at the transition point between the metaplastic and normal epithelium. Um, here, you see that there's abnormal distension, right? So this is a normal distension of the esophagus, but here it, it's just a straight, narrow pipe tube. Um, and this is um, stricture. It's a long segment stricture of the esophagus. That can happen from radiation. Patients who've had prior NG2 placement for a long time can stricture down, uh, or people who try to commit suicide and drink lye uh, can stricture down the entire esophagus. Okay, we're moving on now to um, digestive systems. So, um, so here we have a patient with right lower quadrant pain, and this is the appendix um, right there. So this little blind ending tube, there's fluid, and there's little dots in it that's called appendiculate, little stones. Uh, and if you look at the fat around the appendix, it's gray, right? We call that stranding because there's fluid that stems uh, sort of intercalates into the fat. Uh, so this is appendicitis. Appendicitis is treated with surgery, um, except if it's perforated. If you have, This one is not perforated, but if it's perforated, it can cause an abscess, um, which then needs to be like drained by interventional radiology since it's already perforated. Um, here is um, a MIP image. Uh, and what we see here this is abdomen pelvis, here's a kidney, the liver, spleen, here's the portal vein, splenic vein, and SFV. Um, and there's abnormal tortuous little vessels here, abnormal tortuous vessels. This is called angiodysplasia, um, where you just have this abnormal malformation of art, art, like AV malformation. And that's important because it can bleed sometimes and cause um, GI bleeding. Um, so if if we find that, then um, interventional radiologists, they go in and they embolize this. Just like we saw the embolization of the liver mass, they can do the same thing, but um, target it to the, the, the abnormal tangles of vessels. Uh, here is a patient with left lower quadrant pain. Um, moving down the list. Um, so here we have um, a CT abdomen and pelvis coronal with oral contrast and IV. The portal vein is lit up. And we see this patient has diverticulosis, um, diverticulosis. But in addition, there's bowel wall thickening. And the um, paracolic fascia, this, this thing here, is thickened. And there's um, mesenteric stranding. There's this fat stranding because there's fluid. So this is a complication of diverticulitis. It's called, I mean, of diverticulosis. It's diverticulitis. And it's simple. There's no abscess but sometimes it can perforate and then patients get abscesses which can uh, which have to be drained and sometimes they can fistulize into the bladder into other parts um, vagina so it, it can become very complicated uh, patients have to get an evaluation of colonoscopy later because it can mask colon cancer as well um, here is a very zoomed in view of the duodenum um, we're moving on to the duodenal. So this is the liver here. This is very zoomed in. Um, this is pancreas. Uh, this is the duodenum. Uh, and you see the duodenum, there's um, thickening and there's also stranding in the fat. Uh, so this is duodenitis. And the duodenitis, is, it just, it's just inflammation, but it can be from ulcers. It can be from trauma. It could be, you know, various post-ERCP, you know, where they accidentally perf the duodenum. Uh, so this is what duodenitis looks like. And you want to look for free air uh, to um, make sure there's no perforation because that has to be surgically corrected if there's perforation. Okay, peptic ulcers. Okay, so here is a CT coronal image. Um, this is a stomach, uh, liver, uh, large bowel, heart. And this is a greater curvature of the stomach. This is a lesser curvature of the stomach. And we see this um, abnormal outpouching here. 
Uh, so this is called an ulcer. An ulcer is it's a cap cavitation within the wall. And this patient had an upper GI as well. We said before, upper GI is esophagram plus evaluation of the stomach. And you see this outpouching that corresponds to that uh, ulcer. So this is a giant ulcer, most commonly from H. pylori. Now with antibiotics and protonics, we don't really see it as much anymore. Uh, but you know, this is what ulcers look like. Okay, so um, granulomatous enterocolitis. Uh, this is another name for Crohn's disease. We talked about Crohn's earlier in the inflammatory sec section, um, but we're going to review it briefly in the digestive section. Uh, so Crohn's, uh, they, it has it involves from your mouth to your anus. It has skip lesions, so it can involve the bowel and also segments of the large and small bowel. We said there's different types. There's inflammatory, active inflammatory, and you can also have um, fibrostenosine stricture. So here you see the lumen is narrowed, the bowel proximal is dilated, so there's an obstructive stricture. Um, there's submucosal hyperemia, so there's an, an active inflammatory component on top of um, the stricturing process. And if you look at this, there's this radi like radiating part here, right? It's the central radiation here. And that's um, fibrostenosis, um, fistulus, fistulus. So it's called penetrating disease. It's just inflammatory, so all, it brings all the loops here. So that's classically seen with Crohn's, not ulcerative colitis, which typically only affects the colon and does not have um, the penetrating process or involves like other lesions, or other segments of the small bowel. Um, so that's... Um, Crohn's, they also, it also has non cascading granuloma on histology. Um, here's Hirschsprung. Um, Hirschsprung disease is um, the a ganglion. So it, it's, the normal nerves are not there. Um, so it's, so the patients get megacolon because the, the rectal, the segment that's affected just doesn't open up because there's no, like there's absent normal nerve supply, ganglion. Um, so this is a barium enema. So they put contrast through the rectum and into the colon. And you see like the rectum is very small uh, relative to the col like sigmoid colon. So that's how you diagnose Hirschsprung. And um, babies, you see, we see this with young um, children and they have to get surgically corrected because they have problems defecating. Okay, so um, let's move on to common things. Um, so now we're talking about adhesions uh, and small bowel obstruction. So um, patients who have surgery, they can get scarring, uh, bands, that's called adhesions. And the adhesions can come anytime after they've had prior surgery. And it can um, sort of uh, cause obstruction. Here we see we have small bowel that's very, very dilated. The distal bowel is decompressed. You know, it's like if you had a water hose and you kinked it on one side, the upstream water is going to get really big and the downstream water pipe is going to get really small um, because you have a kink. And that's what we have here. You have a kink. And that arrow points to where the kink is. Um, and so that kink is most commonly from adhesions just because of the prevalence of surgery. Um, that's the most common cause of, of obstruction. But other things that cause obstruction are um, hernias and cancers. So you got to look for those two. Intussusception. So here, um, intussusception is when you have telescoping of bowel into bowel. So here, right there, we have a bowel, and it's going into the bowel, and and it's there's this dark piece in there, this little dark, fat, attenuating piece. That's a lipoma. So that's acting as a lead point um, for the intussusception. So um, in intussusception can be seen incidentally in children. Um, like if they had viral infection, but in adults it's abnormal, and you have to look for a bowel lesion. Here we see a lipoma that has been the lead point for the intussusception. This one um, is another coronal CT abdomen pelvis, and here what we see is um, abnormal air in the mesenteric vessels and in the liver. You should not see air in the liver or in the mesentery. So. And it's a special kind of air because you could see it's like tracking along the vessel. So it's not free air. It's not like pneumo, like pneumoperitoneum. It's air within the venous system. Uh, and you can see that here. So when you see that, it's because there's dead bowel 
somewhere. So here, I don't, you can see it here, there's this air around the wall of the um, colon. That's called pneumatosis intestinalis. Um, that's when the bowel is infarcted and basically um, the air goes into the venous system and then into the portal venous system. So uh, that's a bad sign and patients need to get uh, urgent surgery. Um, here is another example of ischemic bowel. So you see how the bowel wall is thick and it's like non-enhancing. So it's dying ischemia and it's because of an internal hernia. So there's this mushroom shape appearance here um, and it's herniating through this little defect here. Um, so that's dead bowel from an internal hernia or it's dying. It, it might not be dead yet, but it's dying or at least hemorrhagic because the bowel is thick and it's hypertense and it's, not as enhancing. Here's um, a similar dead bowel appearance in children that's called necrotizing enterocolitis. Um, they get air in the wall of the bowel, like you can sort of see here maybe, these little, it looks kind of dirty looking here, in contrast to clean wall here. Um, so that's called necrotizing enterocolitis. It happens in premature children, and the air attracts into the portal venous system. It's sort of hard to see, but there's this like lucency here, this linear lucency, that's necrotizing enterocolitis. Okay. Um, paralytic ileus. So uh, you can have abnormal, um, like a dynamic ileus. So the bowel is not moving very much, and so then all the air that people, that the patient swallows, stays put. So that's what we see here. This is in contrast to normal bowel gas pattern, right? There's diffuse bowel gas, and it's balanced, and it's involving all segments of the bowel. And that happens in patients who are on narcotics for pain, um, patients who are post-op, you know, who have not returned to bowel function yet, uh, patients, really sick patients, um, they have poor bowel motility, so that's ileus. Um, volvulus, okay, so volvulus, um, so here we have a radiograph, and there's this abnormal twisting of bowel. Um, it's a bean shape, um, so this is sigmoid volvulus. Um, and then um, this, on the other hand, is a child. Uh, so the stomach is here, the esophagus is, I mean, stomach, um, this is a duodenum. And the gastroduodenal junction is here on the left side. But here, you see this twisting, and it stays put on the right side. So this is called malrotation. Uh, this is the cartoon version of it. it um, it's from the normal mesentery bowel didn't migrate to the appropriate place, so it's, it was, it's on the right side. And so the pedicle is very short and narrowed. Um, instead of the normal broad mesentery, it's very narrowed. So the, it can twist on the pedicle and cause um, volvulus. So this is called volvulus complicate from malrotation. All right, moving on to liver, um, 930. Um, so here we have um, a patient who has very small liver and it's nodular. There's also gallstones here, uh, but you see large volume ascites. Um, patient also has, um, it's hard to see, but splenomegaly, there's hydrothorax, so there, there's fluid in the, um, the chest, pleural fusion there. So, um, and so in patients who have that, they can get um, tips. Um, and patient has, uh, sometimes they can have upper abdominal varices, like a little bit of tingling. Sometimes it can be in the stomach or in the parasophageal region and cause uh, massive bleeding. Okay, so that was cirrhosis. Okay, so moving on. So cirrhosis, um, the best test for cirrhosis is called an MR elastography, which is what we see here. So there's an external coupler that sends waves and it's an MRI that's done. And then it generates this um, el like an elastogram uh, and so the red parts are cirrhosis, um, the green are like stage one, and then the yellow are like stage two, three. This is a study of choice, it says fibrosis, cirrhosis. Um, this is the external coupler that is attached to the patient when they, um, uh, to send the vibrations in, into the, let's see, um, I wanna show you the external coupler. Um, so it, in the MRI scan, they have this, Oh, I'm sorry, it's not coming out, but um, let's see. So this external coupler that gets attached to the front and it sends waves, it sends wave, as you can see here, and that's the waves that we see here. Um, and then, then you can um, assess how stiff something is um, in the liver and then diagnose 
uh, actually stage the fibrosis. Cirrhosis is end stage fibrosis, um, but there's four stages, one, two, three, four. Two and three are treatable, four is irreversible, that's called cirrhosis. You have like bridging fibrosis. Um, so you want to detect it early and use either MRI or ultrasound elastography to assess what stage they're in. Okay, more stuff in the liver. So here we have liver and this is a spleen and you see the density of the liver is um, darker than the spleen. So that's hypodense. Um, this part of the vessels, um, the hyperdense area. So this is uh, alcohol, oh, not, not alcohol, but it's just fatty liver, hepatic steatosis. It can be from alcohol. Most commonly now actually is from obesity and um, epidemic, the, you know, obesity epidemic. But it, you just have that deposition in the liver and eventually that can lead to, um, you know, fibrosis. Uh, if it's non-alcoholic, you know, from, you know, just like our obesity epidemic, then we call it non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. If it's from alcohol, then obviously it's from alcohol. Um, but um, the problem is that it can lead to end-stage um, cirrhosis, and so patients are at increased risk for HGCs, and they need to, we need to be careful about that. So here it's a MRI. So this is called the in-phase and imposed phase. So MRI, you know, we said is like having apps on the phones. Um, this app is called in and imposed phase, and it looks at fat, fat content. Um, so here on the opposed phase, it becomes dark. So it goes bright and dark. And so you, you, this is diagnostic for fat. And, you, and using MRI, we can tell you exactly how much fat there is in the liver um, to monitor um, the patient's progress, right? Because you want to try diet therapy. And the whole idea is to prevent this patient from going into the fibrosis, cirrhosis pathway and NASH. Um, so MRI can diagnose and quantify fat. Um, in contrast, this is normal liver. So this is in phase, out opposed phase. This has no fatty liver, so this is normal. And so this is abnormal, fatty deposition of liver. Um, so this one, we're talk let's talk a little bit more about cirrhosis, complications of cirrhosis. Um, so the patient has end-stage cirrhosis. And you see these little parasophageal varices, varices. Patient came with massive bleeds, upper GI bleed, and just vomiting hematemesis. They tried to clip him, couldn't do it endoscopically. You see these submucosal gastric varices. Um, the patient also, so here you can see the small liver. The spleen is huge, right? So this is portal hypertension. There's um, all these collaterals, varices right here that's causing the patient's bleeding. Um, so the patient went on to get a TIPS. Um, to decompress the system because there's portal hypertension, there's the portal venous system is high pressure uh, because the the liver is so stiff, it's so hard that it's not um, it's not able to relieve the normal pressure in the portal system. So you can iatrogenically relieve that using doing this procedure called TIPS, where you um, make a communication between the right portal vein and the right hepatic vein. So the right portal and the right hepatic. So you bypass the liver. You're basically bypassing the liver using this to decompress um, the varices um, so that the patient doesn't die of like um, exsanguination from hematemesis. So that's what TIPS is. So, all right, um, CBD stones, okay, 940. Uh, here we have an MRCP. MRCP looks at the biliary system. It's an MRI study. Uh, and you do an MR MRCP when you're trying to understand what's going on in the bile, bile ducts. Um, so this patient here um, has, this is a CBD. This is the duodenum. This is the in right and left hepatic ducts. And this is severely dilated. And it's dilated because of this little guy here. This is a filling defect. Uh, it's a stone. It's a stone in the CBD. Uh, and sometimes it can migrate from the gallbladder. We don't see the gallbladder here because it was resected. Um, so this just has a CBD stone. And so here's the pancreatic duct. Um, so then uh, the gastroenterologist can go in with ERCP endoscopically and then do a pap um, sphincterotomy, open up the ampulla, and then balloon. Um, they could just sweep, do a balloon sweep to remove the CBD stone to relieve the obstruction. Um, CBD cholecystitis. So you can get complications of gallstones uh, when the cystic duct is obstructed from a stone um, or something else. Like if there's an infl inflammation, it can also cause obstruction of the cystic duct. 
And here we see the gallbladder is markedly thickened. Um, there's distension and there's inflammation. So this is acute cholecystitis. Uh, the key is, you know, you want to make sure there's not a CBD stone because you might be able to take out the gallbladder, but if there's abnormal, you know, bilirubin and you're worried about a CBD stone, you need to get an MRCP because um, you can get CBD obstruction because um, the gall cholecystitis doesn't, address the CBD, it only addresses the gallbladder. So we need an MRCP if there is elevated um, bilirubin and you're worried about obstruction. All right, so here is a gallbladder, gallstone, that has migrated into the ileum. So it's this is called um, gallstone ileus. Um, basically, you know, there, uh, ad, there's an abnormal fistula between the gall, gall CBD um, and the duodenum, and then the the stone goes into the bowel and then causes a distal obstruction. Um, here is the transition point. You see the stone. And then upstream, there's is markedly dilated. Um, so that's called gallstone ileus. It's not really ileus. It's an obstruction. Ileus suggests that there's no mechanical obstruction. But here we have a mechanical obstruction. So that's actually like a misnomer. But that's gallstone ileus. Um, okay, biliary system. So um, we so here we have an ultrasound. This is the gallbladder. This is a cystic duct, um, and this is the cystic duct is um, dilated. Um, ooh, here, here's um, so then the the duct, the stone. This is the MRCP. The stone can cause compression of the CBD, even though it's not in the CBD, like a CBD stone. A ginormous stone can cause compression of the adjacent CBD and cause biliary ductal dilatation, which we see here. And this, this is called Maritzi syndrome. Um, so you treat that with cholecystectomy. Um, now we're moving on to the biliary system. Um, here we have an MRI. This is the liver. Um, here's uh, an axial liver. And you see the liver is, um, there's these little like reticular reticulations. Um, the, the liver also, if you look at the surface, it's, not, it's nodular. Um, so this is, it's a hard diagnosis, um, but this is a primary biliary cholangitis. Um, uh, you know, you need biopsy to make this diagnosis. Uh, but you see, all we can really say is that there's diffuse liver disease. Uh, it's an abnormal looking liver. Um, the liver look, should look like the spleen, right? It's, it's homogeneous like the spleen, but here it's very heterogeneous um, and abnormal signal intensity. Um, here, another problem with the biliary system is called PSE, primary sclerosis and cholangitis. Patients with Crohn's um, ulcerative colitis can get this. Um, the, so uh, the bile ducts are abnormal. Um, there's sclerosis, so scarring. So you get this bead appearance. Um, structure, like a, it's like alternating dilatation, structure, dilatation structures because uh, the, the actual bile ducts are abnormal. Uh, and it causes, you know, cholangitis, inflammation of the bile ducts. Um, so the thing they do transplants for this if it leads to end-stage liver failure. Okay, pancreas, um, 950. Uh, so pancreas here is a CT abdomen pelvis spleen. This is a liver. Um, this is the pancreas. This is a duodenum. And you see there's all of this inflammation around the pancreas. The pancreas, the normal fat intercalated into the pancreas is obliterated. So this is interstitial edema. So this is pancreatitis. You can diagnose pancreatitis with light base and amylase, but we get CT because you can. We have to diagnose complications, um, and one of the complications is called necrotizing pancreatitis. Um, and here is an example of necrotizing pancreatitis. So the pancreas is no longer enhancing, and you get this fluid collection uh, in, in place of normal pancreas, and this is. Patients with necrotizing pancreatitis have an eight-fold increase of death. Um, so the high morbidity, you know, um, I, I remember when I was a resident or fellow, like every year after Coachella, somebody always came in with necrotizing pancreatitis from binge drinking. Um, so it's, it's very dangerous. Uh, and so we do CT to not diagnose pancreatitis, but complications of pancreatitis. Uh, here um, is calcifications in the stones, in the ducts, as well as in the pancreas. And this is a sequelae of acute pancreatitis. So this is chronic pancreatitis. After a while, it starts to calcify. The pancreas get really small. There's stones that develop. Um, so that's chronic pancreatitis. Uh, pancreatic pseudocyst, so patients who've had 
pancre pancreatitis can develop fluid collections um, in and around the pancreas. That's called a pseudocyst because uh, it's not a cyst. It's just fluid that's been walled off. It's not a, a, a cyst. It's an epithelial line collection, but this is a pseudocyst because it doesn't have epithelium line. It's just fluid that's been walled off. Uh, so they call it a pseudocyst. Um, so that's what that is here. Uh, and and here's a bigger one here in the tail, a pseudocyst. So you have to have a diagnosis of pancreatitis that precedes diagnosis of pseudocyst. If you don't, then you're going to think about pancreatic tumors, cystic pancreatic lesions, IPMNs, um, not pseudocysts. You need to have a diagnosis of pancreatitis that precedes the diagnosis of pseudocysts. Um, so that you're not confusing it for like more sinister uh, conditions. Uh, so ascites, oh, we've seen a lot of examples of ascites already, but here's another one just that happens in patients who have portal hypertension. Um, usually the liver is abnormal, cirrhotic, and they get free volume, free fluid, large volume free fluid. Um, they can also get hydrothorax, large right pleural fusion. Um, patients who have refractory hydrothorax that doesn't resolve with you know conventional therapies or upper GI bleeds from parasophageal varices can get tips to decompress the um, portal system. But you know, be careful because you don't put tips on everyone because when patients get tips, they um, have an increased chance of tipping over to liver failure uh, because you're bypassing the liver, so the liver is no longer getting fed. Uh, by the portal venous system, so they, they they actually get worse. But you know, it's a balance of um, two evils. Like, should they die of upper GI bleeds, or should they die of end stage liver disease? So, you know, it's it's you got to balance the risks and the, uh, risks and benefits. Um, we've talked about adhesions already, but here are more examples of adhesions that happen after surgery. So here you can imagine like a waste um, that can cause like an internal hernia. Um, here's um, a really beautiful adhesion that causes a kink in it, um, but that's the leading cause of small bowel obstruction in adults. Uh, trauma, okay. So trauma, um, here, trauma, high velocity MVCs, motor vehicle accidents. Um, here we have a contrast in SCT, so there's uh, blood around the liver. Um, there's um, free air, this I think is up here um, is free air. Uh, and it looks like there might be contrast extravasation here. Um, maybe like um, active extravasation. Um, and here we have air in the Morrison's pouch. That's abnormal. Uh, and this is a duodenum. Uh, so that's a retroperitoneum. So it's, uh, I'm sorry, I, I think I, I take the back. Um, if it's Morrison's pouch is not retroperitoneum, it's intraperitoneal. Um, but anyway, so we have, uh, injury, bowel injury causing free air. Um, and patients need to go into surgery right away to fix the um, bowel injury. Um, digestive system, we're talking about foreign body. This patient uh, intentionally or unintentionally swallowed a nail. Uh, sometimes we can get fish bones that sort of um, can cause obstruction and perforation as well. Uh, so trauma, so here is a, a patient who, pelvis CT. Um, this is the inguinal, the internal and external inguinal ring, internal and external ring, ring and there's uh, stranding and inguinal hernia um, that has gone into the internal ring. Um, the internal, inferior epigastric is here, so it's lateral to the inferior epigastric, so that's an indirect hernia. If it's medial to the inferior epigastric, that's a direct hernia, directly through the Hasselbach triangle. Um, here the sagittal, this is a big hernia through the inguinal canal. Uh, this one has small bowel, mesentery. Sometimes they have colon, they have bladder. A lot of things can herniate. Uh, so here there's um, a femoral hernia. So it goes to the femoral ring, not the internal ring. And you know it's a femoral hernia because it's in the femoral triangle. It's right next to the femoral artery and vein. Here the femoral artery and vein is here. So it's away. So this is inguinal hernia versus femoral hernia, which is, and sometimes it can compress the femoral vein. Femoral hernias are dangerous because usually the neck is very small, so it can get strangulated. Um, so typically femoral hernias are corrected uh, urgently because of risk of strangulation because the neck is very small. Um, and here is um, in a small bowel follow-through. Uh, so the contrast is in the small bowel now, and you can see that this little hernia comes down. Um, I'm not sure if this is Maybe it's febrile. Um, okay, so you guys are texting me. Is it time to go? Um, I just haven't been paying attention to your text, but let's see. 
no, I, sorry, I have to go to class, but thank you so much. Okay, um, so we can um, stop here. Uh, let me see. Let me just stop the video. Uh, so this is a, um, a hernia. So this is a, a radiograph, um, sagittal radi radiograph, and we see that this is the abdominal wall. Um, there is small bowel um, anteriorly. Um, and here is a CT version of it. So there's small bowel that's outside the anterior abdominal wall, and there's um, fat and bowel in it. So this is an anterior midline ventral hernia. Um, and it could be from different causes, trauma, um, prior surgery. Uh, um, yeah. So here, um, open wound abdominal. So this is a patient who had a high velocity injury. Uh, so we have free high density fluid. That's you know, hemoperitoneum. And there's stranding here posteriorly from a hematoma. And then there's fractures of the pelvis there and there. And then there's... Um, hematomas here with high density um, stuff here. That's active extravasation. So this patient has multiple injuries. So there's laceration of the kidney, there's a laceration of the spleen, um, and there's you know free hemoperitoneum um, and multiple pelvic um, sacral fractures. Um, this is a high velocity um, injury with multiple organ and um, bone fractures. Um, so here, um, this is a patient with upright radiograph, and under the diaphragm, there's this lucency here. This is called free air, where there's free, there's probably viscous perforation uh, causing air uh, to go under the diaphragm. Uh, so that's uh, free air, and it can happen when you see that. You know, you have to have a high level of suspicion and take the patient to the OR urgently. And here's a large volume free air with lucency under the diaphragm. Uh, Borhoff syndrome is a condition when you have a perforation of the uh, distal esophagus from forceful, um, just for, like increased pressure in a um, unrelaxed esophagus. So you get, um, here we have contrast extravasation outside of the normal um, esophagus, and then there's this lucency here tracking, uh, which is from pneumomediastinum with air tracking into the mediastinum. Uh, so that's Borhoff syndrome. Here's an esophagram that shows you the perforation. So this esophagram shows that the esophagus is here, but there's this extra luminal collection here uh, consistent with perforation that has to be surgically corrected. Uh, so uh, here's a CT of Borhoff syndrome. Um, the other one was cervical perforation, but here there's free air here, and then there's free air um, throughout the abdomen. And um, when it scrolls up, we can see that there's air in the mediastinum. Um, so this is air secondary to perforation. Umbilical hernia, um, here is the patient CT abdomen pelvis, and there's a defect in the like, ventral wall, and there's fat that herniates out. Um, there's fat that herniates out here laterally, and that's a hernia. And sometimes the fat can strangulate and cause pain. But typically, it's asymptomatic, and you don't have to do anything about it because small bowel is not in it, so there's not a risk of strangulation. Um, here... This is an example of congenital malformation of the pancreas. Um, so the pancreas normally abuts the duodenum, uh, but in certain congenital abnormalities, the pancreas can go entirely around the duodenum. This increases the risk of pancreatitis. And that's what we see here. So the pancreas goes completely around the duodenum, uh, which has contrast within it. And that's annular pan pancreas, which can increase the risk of pancreatitis. Uh, this is um, a HIDA scan. So this is a normal appearance of a HIDA scan. A HIDA scan is a molecular imaging study that uh, tags, um, follows bilirubin. So it gets excreted into the bile ducts and then goes into the small bowel like we see here. There's bowel. And then there's the bright spot is the gallbladder um, where there's collection. Um, this patient is a young it's a neonate. Um, there's uptake in the liver, but there's no excretion in the 
bile in the gallbladder or in the GI tract. Uh, so this is diagnostic for biliary atresia, which means the absence of bile ducts. And the patient has to, um, there's no CBD, so they, they, a Kasai procedure is performed uh, where they bring a loop of small bowel and connect it to the, um, the whatever duct is remaining so that there's a way to drain the bowel ducts. This can lead to end-stage liver failure if not treated. Um, here, congenital disorders called esophageal atresia. Uh, this patient here had an NG tube placed, and the NG tube coiled on itself. It's a young child. You can see that the physis is not formed. Um, and this is um, because the, there's a atretic segment um, with discontinuity of the esophagus. Um, here we have an umbilical catheter. Um, here is an upper GI. It's in a young child. And um, what we are looking at is um, normal. This is the normal upper GI in a child. Um, the gastrojejunal junction should be in the left upper quadrant. But here we see, which is what we see here, right? The bowel goes to the left side. In contrast, in this abnormal study, um, the patient has contrast and it stays to the right of the abdomen. Uh, so this is called malrotation um, because there is incomplete rotation of the bowel to the left upper quadrant. Uh, congenital disorders. So here we have um, a complication of malrotation. It's called a mid gut um, volvulus. So um, we, the patient's, the malrotated bowel is on the right side. The pedicle is very narrow, so it can twist on itself. Uh, and cause malrotation and volvulus. So there's no contrast that passes into the jejunum. And this has to be urgently surgically corrected, otherwise they can infarct their bowel. Um, more, this is a Meckel's diverticulum, which is a diverticulum of the ilium. And some subsets of diverticulum, uh, it's a remnant, a congenital remnant from a, um, uh, you know, communication, uh, it's called Villatine. So the Meckel's diverticulum, it's a congenital diverticulum from a remnant of the umphalomesenteric um, duct, called, also called the vitellin duct or the yolk stock. And a portion of it, like 50%, can have um, gastric mucosa in it that causes bleeding, and that can be diagnosed with a Meckel scan. Uh, and you can see there's this increased focal uptake that increases over time. Uh, so that's consistent with the Meckel's diverticulum. Mm -hmm. um, this is an ultrasound image of a patient with pyloric stenosis. Uh, so this is the liver. This is the stomach. Uh, this is the pylorus. And you can see the pylorus, it's thickened uh, and it's elongated and it's not relaxing. Uh, and that's what happens in patients with pyloric stenosis. They, um, you can have this little palpable ball um, called, they call it an olive um, appearance or uh, sensation. Uh, and it's poorly, um, it's not relaxing. So patients, children can have um, intractable vomiting and intolerance of PO. Uh, this is a, a CT with an enlarged, markedly enlarged stomach. And we see that the, pile, um, the antrum of the, Stomach is thickened and abnormal. Uh, this is gastric outlet obstruction, causing gastric outlet obstruction. Um, this, this abnormality um, can be seen with, this is gastric cancer with gastric outlet obstruction. Uh, the, the mass is here in the distal antrum. Uh, this is a gastric emptying study patient eat a burger uh, that is mixed with technetium colloid and then we look at the gastric emptying here it doesn't empty um, as expected after 90 minutes uh, so this is consistent with gastric paresis uh, which happens in diabetic patients uh, which is different from gastric alic obstruction uh, where there's an obstructing um, mass or lesion um, but they can have similar presentation of nausea and vomiting, although the underlying pathophysiology is different. Uh, this is a patient with uh, a tracheoesophageal fistula. So um, it's an 
an esophagram and uh, there's contrast here. This is the spine. This is the heart of the patient. Patient's facing this way, rotated to the right. And um, when the patient drinks fluid, it goes into the airways, the bronchogram. Uh, bronchial anatomy is highlighted. So there's an abnormal communication between the bronchial and the <coughs> esophagus. Excuse me. There's an abnormal communication with uh, between the esophagus and the bronchial anatomy. Uh, so to close our lecture, this is an esophagram, and we see there's abnormal contractions consistent with uh, dysmotility. Um, left lower quadrant pain, this is a patient with diverticulosis, and there's this is complicated by uh, diverticulitis, and there's abnormal stranding. Um, there's also ovarian uh, cysts. Uh, this is a patient with abdominal pain. There's abnormal um, ileal thickening enhancement and engorgement uh, consistent with enteritis. In this case, this is a long segment abnormality. Uh, this is, um, uh, can be seen with Crohn's. Uh, this is a liver protocol study. We do a non-contrast, contrast enhance, and then the washout phase. And you see the mass is enhancing and washes out. And that is uh, a HCC because the patient has background cirrhosis. This study is called transarterial chemoembolization taste. This is before uh, the beads are released into the parasitic vessel, feeding the liver HCC. And then this is the post-taste ablation after the artery to the mass has been blocked off by beads. Um, and that's the taste run. The study, the diagnosis in this case, uh, there's bowel, dilated bowel, small bowel, and then there's uh, decompressed distal small bowel. So this is a small bowel obstruction, and this is the transition point where the dilated bowel becomes markedly narrowed, and the most common cause is adhesions. Mm -hmm. This study is a CT colonoscopy, colonography. There's air that's insufflated into the colon, and the study is used to screen for colon cancer. Uh, it's recommended by USPFTF uh, as an alternative form to colonoscopy and uh, sigmoidoscopy with fecal occult blood. Uh, this is a MRI, and this is an in-phase, out-of-phase. So MRI has the capacity to quantify fat in the liver, uh, and it could be used to monitor treatment for patients with hepatic steatosis. Uh, so this is what we did. Um, thank you so much for your time.